Good morning, 982. This is Miss Lawson bringing you another week's worth of work. And in actual fact, it's your final week. It is your final week of Inspector Calls. Now, that's not to say this is going to be your last final week of this text forever. Um, we are going to revisit it or you'll revisit with your new teachers next year and the year after. So hopefully, if you've done the learning and carried it out as, as best as, as you can with my instruction, um, you'll have a firm grip of actually what um, happens in the play, you'll have a firm understanding of the three different acts, you'll definitely have a firm understanding of the characters. Um, and we have touched each character throughout the play as the inspectors uh, inspected them essentially. But today we're going to finalise everything that we've learnt um, and look at you inspecting the inspector himself. Um, and you're going to have an assignment question at the very end, which will be formally marked with um, whole class feedback. So it's imperative that uh, you follow along. Now, if you find that perhaps, and I've had a, a communication with some of you um, the last few weeks, to find that you know perhaps you're finding uh, things a little bit of a, of a you know a bit of a struggle, um, and you are dipping in and out of the lessons, I'm. All I can say to you is really my best advice is to go right back to the very beginning. You can change the date setting on your go for school so you can see all of your homework which has been set since um, since the school closed. Now that what that's going to do, I mean it was, probably doesn't feel very nice psychologically to go back and think oh my goodness I'm going to go and look at this homework that was set six weeks ago. But the only way that these lessons are really going to work because I've ordered it and structured it that you are looking at each character throughout the progression of the play, you need to go back and, and just uh, go through those lessons again. So if you haven't done that, pause this video and uh, go back and, and do your best. Even if you're not going to take part in the tasks, at least watch the videos and read PDF. Okay, so today's lesson is going to be a mixture of my face, of my um, visualizer and my PowerPoint. Uh, we do have a do now task, first off and then we're going to recap exactly what we looked at last lesson now there are three adjectives here to describe the inspector it was seen within the very initial introduction to the inspector right at the very beginning interestingly i say this all the time whenever i'm t uh, teaching this tart this um text they are very similar adjectives to how Priestley um, has described the furniture in the dining room of the House of the Burlings. That's quite interesting that the inspector has the same sort of um, same fundamental basics he's been described in a very similar way, which is quite interesting. What I'd like you to do is write down a list of synonyms and connotations look at these three words. That's it, just these three words. So, solidity, purpose, purpose purposefulness, goodness gracious, I need to get my teeth in, and massiveness. In what way is massiveness related to solidity? And how are purposefulness and massiveness related? Okay, and how does the word purposefulness <laughs> tie in with what we have learned so far in the play? You are going to have to use your um, thesaurus or dictionary, um, you can use your phone, Google it, find up um, some of those three <clears throat> meanings first and foremost if you're not entirely sure exactly what they mean um, and make sure that you're looking at linking to a person as opposed to perhaps an object because that sometimes does change the definition so five ten minutes go away and answer those questions I'm really interested to see those written down in your books Okay, so what we had looked at last lesson, uh, we were just finishing kind of getting through Eric, um, and he was basically essentially the final person to to be interrogated by um, the inspector. Um, the word interrogate is quite an interesting word actually, and whether we feel like actually in some of the characters he didn't actually have to interrogate too much at all. Someone like such as Sheila is quite forthcoming, and she realised soon off right from the get go that she would have had. To, you know, a massive part to play in this girl's death, and um, she was quite forthcoming with her with her information. And I think Eric probably fits into that same category as well. So what we're going to look at today is the inspector. So let's go back, whistle way back a few weeks, and the inspector's entrance, the initial stage directions, and this is where the do now task is ties in. The inspector need not be a big man, but he creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity, and get ready for it, purposefulness. He is a man in his 50s, dressed in a plain darkish suit of the period. He speaks carefully, weightily, and has a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before actually speaking. And let's just pause, you don't have to write anything, but why do we think Priestley chose these particular words to describe the impression of the inspector makes? 
Obviously, if you've done the do now task, you're going to have a really good firm grip of those three um, adjectives and nouns. And so hopefully you're going to have a good firm grasp of why Preeti might have chosen to use those words. Um, what we've also looked at is the contrasting views. So remember, Mr. Burning was essentially the very first person that the inspector um, came across and wanted to ask questions because he had the very first pivotal role in the, um, you know, the, the death of Eva Smith and his role was obviously as her employer. All the way along, we can see the inspector having this battle with this family. Okay, um, He was having this battle because he was trying to get them to see that actually they all had a part to play in this girl's death and they all had a responsibility. Responsibility is one of the biggest aspects of this play. I'm sure it's not lost on you. Priestley was trying to use his characters and use this play to teach the audience something that he wanted to, to, to teach them. He wanted uh, to convey his ideas of society onto the audience of 1945. Interesting why he used it uh, was set in 1912. We can just, you know, deliberate and debate that further on. What we need to see is actually a very simplistic um, uh, simple view of what the inspector was trying to do because that is going to be your ultimate um, goal by the end of this lesson. There are obviously new techniques you've come across as well um, and so well done to those of you that have managed. You remember there was a story that you had to write with um, antiplosis involved in that chain of events and if you have a look at this um, this was um, uh, something that you'd learned a couple of weekend, a couple weekend, weeks ago. So antiplosis um, and this is where his very first act, and he said, because what happened to her, they may have determined what happened to her afterwards, and what happened to her afterwards may have driven her to suicide, a chain of events. And lo and behold, what do we see? We see that there actually was a chain of events. Every single person in that family had a huge, pivotal, important role. Now, throughout the play, beyond Act 1, when he started to, uh, you know, intercept and talk to the, um, the members of the family, we can see different um, elements of the inspector, but actually as a character, he stays pretty static. He is pretty pretty much the same person. He doesn't seem to lose his temper. He doesn't become over agitated necessarily. He, I mean, he does lose his temper in terms of his, you can tell he's exasperated, but he's quite rational, he's quite methodical. He deals with them one by one by one, and he says that quite throughout the play. So if you want to make notes of this, Let's do it as we as we go along together. We can pause it. So initially, he seems to be an ordinary Bromley police officer, yet he's eventually something more ominous, perhaps even supernatural. And so, intercepting there for one second. Hopefully, you've all now read full three acts, and we all know what happens at the end, um, where we find out actually the inspector goes. <clears throat> And they start picking apart and wondering, actually, was he real inspector? And Gerald goes away and finds out, actually, no, he wasn't. And then, you know, there's a duff, duff, duff moment again, where actually a real inspector uh, phones and they're on the way and there has actually been a death. So <clears throat> there's a whole throughout the whole play is actually, is he a ghost? Is he a time traveler? Is he supernatural? Is he there to teach them a message? Um, so J.P. Priestley writes, the inspector need not be a big man, but he creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity. And purposefulness. Unlike the other character, Inspector Gould's character doesn't change. He always remains assertive throughout the play. Um, he definitely commands and takes a control over characters as the play progresses. And he does that through his um, body language, if you look at the stage directions, and how he actually is saying those words he is saying. So his words are quite forthright. He's, he's definitely keeping cool and keeping in control. But actually, if you look at the stage directions, you'll see him being described as saying carefully and weightily, or with a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before he speaks. He heightens drama, so his entrances and exits are well timed in order to create an extra attention. Okay, so there's that, that one, sort of keep going about the duff 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 moments, but it's the way that Priestley has structured the play, there is definitely a, a maximum tension achieved. He controls the structure of the play as well, so each revelation moves the play one step forward, and that's why I want you to really um, teach you it in this way. We've done one character at a time, and we've moved forward throughout the play. Um, let's have a look at the very end. So he is Priestley's voice. He represents Priestley's strong moral view. His job is to make the characters change their attitudes, face up to what they have done, and start taking responsibility for each other and for those in society. This is where the context you've learned is so important. If you remember, if you go all the way back 
we looked at the NHS, we looked at the welfare system, uh, we looked at um, you know the role of like unmarried mothers and what was deemed society societally acceptable. We've even looked at, briefly looked at gender. These kind of things you're going to look at further on. <clears throat> As the, as the years go on, as you've been studying this, but hopefully you've learned enough to know that actually it's integral what Priestley was trying to show to, to the society at the time. Let's have a look at this very, very final um, final side before he leaves, or this the penultimate side before he leaves. If you look here, again, taking charge, masterfully, stop, um, and they're suddenly quiet, staring at him. Uh, I don't need to know any more, neither do you. This girl killed herself and died a horrible death, but each of you helped to kill her. Remember that. Never forget it. But then I don't think you ever will. Remember what you did, Mrs. Burning. You turned her away when she needed help. She, you refused her, even the pitiful little bit of organised charity you had in your power to grant her. Remember what you did. Eric then says, my God, I'm not likely to forget. And then inspectors now turned on to Eric and said, just use her for the end of a stupid, drunken evening as if she were an animal, a thing, not a person. No, you won't forget. And you can see here, stage directions, he's now looking at Sheila. I know, I had to turn that of a job. I started it. And the inspector said, you helped, but you didn't start it. And rather savagely to Burling, Mr. Burling, you started it. She wanted 25 shillings a week instead of 22. And you made her pay a heavy price for that. And now she'll make you pay a heavier price still. Mr. Burning, he's now looking unhappily. Look, Inspector, I'd give thousands. Yes, thousands. Inspector, Inspector says, you're offering the money at the wrong time, Mr. Burning. Um, <clears throat> he's looking at concluding the session here, which is quite interesting. And then he surveys them. Uh, and he says, no, I don't think any of you will forget. Nor that young man Croft, though he had some affection for her at least, um, and made her happy for a lot for a time. Well, Eva Smith's gone. You can't do her any more harm, and you can't do her any good now either. You can't even say, I'm sorry, Eva Smith. Okay. So I always remember, it says Gerald, <coughs> uh, Gerald Croft, he's obviously still out of the house at this point, um, but he's obviously, even in his speech at the final kind of uh, pages, he's still mentioning Gerald and his role in this. Okay. So, what we need to look at is the final, final speech. So, that was the penultimate little bit where he's making sure that everyone understood their role. And then we have the speech. And you're going to get to know this speech um, on, like, on the back of your hand. So, let's just change the camera. And what you need to do is turn to page 53 if you have it. And if then you're going to excuse my nails. Don't be thinking that teachers have loads of time. That's free time because my nails, my nails wouldn't look like this. Let me just show if I can get it to um, to focus. <clears throat> Rather frustrating in the way that these are being printed. If you have got one of these copies or you will be receiving one next year, the final speech, which is the, the one of the most pivotal parts of the play, which is the conclusion, the sort of the, you know where he's essentially leaving them. Uh, with their last thought, his last thoughts is split onto page, which is really annoying. Um, page 53 at the end, so we're going to take it from here. So the inspector says, One Eva Smith has gone, but there are millions and millions of Eva Smiths and John Smiths still left with us with their lives, their hopes and fears, their suffering and chance, their chance of happiness, all intertwined with our lives, with what we think and say and do. We don't live alone. We are members of one body. We're responsible for each other. And I tell you that the time will soon come when if men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. We don't live alone. Good night. And he walks straight out, leaving them staring, subdued and wondering. Obviously, we can see the ramifications and the results of his actual words here. There's people still drinking. She is still crying. Mrs. Burning's collapsed onto a chair. It's all very interesting how he's just literally left them slightly dumbfounded. And if you think about the comparison between how he walked in on this amazing um, celebration of this engagement and now he's just left them in this way, very powerful. And that speech especially is very, very powerful. Powerful. And why? Well... There's some really fantastic things in this. Why do you think that he's mentioned um, Eva Smith and John Smith? Interestingly, why did Priestley choose the name Eva Smith? And we looked briefly at 
the idea of Daisy Renton and the connotations and the inferences we can get from the name Daisy and Renton. But why would Priestley use Eva Smith? Well, Smith, firstly, really common name. He's also mentioned in this final part here, the um, inspectors mentioned John Smith, because actually the gender of the person that they have uh, treated terribly is irrelevant. The idea of gender does come up throughout the play. Um, but on the whole, in terms of taking responsibility and making sure people are treated properly and correctly, actually is irrelevant of the gender. And so John Smith, one of the most common names, and he's done that deliberately. Um, if you have a look through here, he's used some fantastic emotive language. We've got the words suffering, uh, the hopes and fears, um, and all intertwined with our lives. So that's the whole point of the Burlings. They don't believe that their lives are intertwined with others. They believe that their life is separate to to, their, to the people of the masses of the working class, but actually he's trying to teach them, no, you're not, you're all intertwined. Um, we don't live alone. Really, really lovely. And actually it's really, really applicable to what we're seeing in the news at the moment. We don't live alone. And it's a really, really good reminder to actually say we are supposed to be a collective unit. We're humans. We all live on this earth together and we should treat each other with the same respect and integrity. Uh, we are members of one body and we're responsible for each other. <clears throat> now, interesting. There is um, the idea of one body, which links into a religious connotation. And there's a slide coming up with that second. Um, we're responsible for each other. And I tell you that the time will soon come when if men will not learn that lesson, they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. Well, very, very powerful. Like I said, it has um, strong um, links to religion. Uh, fire, blood and brimstone, if you remember, it's related to hell, and if you don't learn the lesson, that's where you're going to be going. Um, but also, 1945, the audience, what they just lived through, they've just lived through six years of war, uh, and where their houses have been bombed, so the idea of fire and blood and anguish will really, really resonate with the audience of 1945. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you to copy this extract out into your books if you haven't got a copy of it already. It is just this bit, it's just the part that I've just read, and now I need you to start getting your highlighters out. I have talked about it briefly, but I'm really interested to see what you can come up with. Um, and then after you've done that, so this is probably going to take you a good 20 minutes to go through this, so pause this video, take your time. Like I said, this is going towards an assessment, but also you're going to need this speech over and over again. So it's really important that you pick it apart and delve into it as much as you can. Um, so annotate it. Consider his word choice, the sentence structure. Let me just point the sentence structures out. Look here. Um, with what we think and say and do, full stop. We don't live alone. Full stop. We are members of one body. Full stop. It's very, very reminiscent and reflective of, of other speeches that we could see, use from, from real life, such as perhaps um, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Winston Churchill, um, Mayor Angelou. I mean, throughout the whole of history, there is a way of writing a speech that makes more um, impact. And we've discussed that in class, and you've had to write a speech before in, in one of my lessons before. And using sentence structure is re fundamentally really, really important. Also, look at the imagery. I've clicked and talked about on um, certain words here, but I would like you to really just take 20 minutes to see um, what else you can make of it. Okay, so task two. Um, analyzing rhetorical tropes. So tropes are uh, essentially themes um, that run through something or conventions essentially. Um, so let's have a look. If you want to draw this table out, this will be your task too. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my goodness gracious, I'll just write it down. Your answer is going to be um, so much better if you have all this planning done, okay? Um, it's not a simple case of watching my video and then just writing out something. I really want you to give it everything that you can. However, I have differentiated the fact that I do understand that some of this is, is you know, quite hard to access. So there are three levels that I'm looking for. The very, very basic that you must, must, must include. Emotive vocabulary, inclusive language, we, and rhythm and sentence structure. You must be able to comment on a sentence structure, for instance. We've done this to death within class. Then there is the silver award, so to speak, 
Juxtaposition, contrasting words or phrases. Remember, we've looked at juxtaposition, it's complete contrast. A writer would do that deliberately to make the worst thing seem even more unbearable, okay? And sometimes if he wants to make something really happy or come across as really happy and pleasing, he will mention something terrible to make the good thing seem even better. And then the rule of three, um, or the triplet or the trichome, can you find the rule of three in there? And then if you're feeling really adventurous, uh, gold. I would like you to find two new terms. It's exciting. We've obviously looked at allodiplosis, um, which I'm hopeful that some of you at least are going to have heard the word and so next year you're like, oh yes, this law taught me allodiplosis. Even if you're not entirely sure, at least you'll have been aware of it. Let's just recap over here. So allodiplosis uh, the repetition of a prominent and usually the last word in one phrase or the clause at the beginning of the next. Remember that speech of the inspector, the chain of events? Now these are two new terms, new terminology, so write them down, at least just have them in your exercise book. Anaphora. I just love the word anaphora so much. Uh, the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of a successive clause. Write that down for a second and I'm going to give you an example. Then polysyndeton, again, another fantastic word. Repetition of conjunctions in close succession, as in we have ships and men and money. Polysyndeton, really, really simple to remember. It's uh, You can remember a, you know, a child, and they're perhaps three or four, and they're describing their day at a beach, for instance, and they will say to you in a very sweet and child um, childish way, we had... Uh, ice cream and hot dog and crisps and we flew a kite and we sat and played seaside uh, sand castles and we went swimming with that conjunction of and 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 um and actually it's really it's really nice because what it does is it creates emphasis of what is in that list as opposed to just changing it to commas so instead of saying i went to the beach and i had hot dog comma ice cream comma we played sand castles comma Actually, if you say and, 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 it really creates emphasis. In terms of anaphora, repetition of a word, the phrase, the beginning of successive clauses, you can see that again in, in lots of famous um, uh, speeches where you start something, uh, each sentence with the same word or phrase. So, I went to the supermarket. I went to the beach. I went to uh, the airport. I don't know why I'm obsessed with beaches and, and airports, I have no idea. So if you have a look at this um, speech here, I'm going to give you a little tip. We don't live alone. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. It's a form of repetition, but it happens at the beginning of each clause or sentence. Okay, and it can be a whole word, it can be a whole phrase repeated. There's lots of songs or have it. And what it does really, A, it creates emphasis. But secondly, it also gives um, the extract extra rhythm, uh, which means then obviously you can, it takes on extra meaning, it's more mem uh, memorable, it, um, it, just, it just creates that nice rhythm of a text. Um, so write those two definitions down. I have given you a little hint with that last one, um, Anaphora, and you've got to highlight um, and find it on your extract. So once you've written it into your little grid, into your chart, go back, annotate your text, and then we can move forward. Okay, and um, when we were reading through the extract, I did touch upon the fact that there was um, some religious um, connotations. The inspector fuses the ap apocalyptic imagery and sense of social responsibility in the Bible with the same rhetorical tropes of a classical speech. So again, we've just mentioned that. Consider the, thing, the following passage, comparing the style to the inspector's final speech and how are they similar and how are they dissimilar. Let's have a look at this, um, this part from the Bible. Even if you're not religious, it's still really interesting that Priestley has chosen to use very similar techniques and tropes from the Bible when he's trying to convey his message. So this comes from Corinthians. Um, it says here, remember this is you know, apparently written I don't know, 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, my history buff, <laughs> the Bible is not up to date, but it certainly wasn't in 1945. Um, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. 
For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Okay, so what they're saying there essentially in the Bible is saying that every single person within society is needed, regardless of whether you are someone who seems to be really, really important. Perhaps you're working class or lower down, you're working on the farm, it doesn't matter. Everyone needs everyone, which is really, really similar to what Priestley is trying to, to, to convey. Um, through through this play um, and it's interesting so if you want to go back and highlight uh, links to the Bible you can do um, and that will obviously go into your um, emotive language section of your chart so why are we doing this well we need to get on to the final question so let's have a look at the uh, essay end of topic assessment it is a form of assessment because we are going to start something new next week um, for the remaining uh, I think it's four weeks to the end of term. So your question is, how does Priestley use the character of the inspector to suggest ways that society could be improved? I've chosen something quite similar, quite sorry, um, simple, because throughout the whole of each of the people, uh, the his, uh, characters that he's studied and investigated and interrogated, we can see a link to society. So hopefully you will have lots and lots of things to write about. So you need to write about what society is shown to be like in the play and how it might be improved. Remember the audience of 1945 and think about how Priestley presents society through what the inspector says and does. Okay, pause this video, write those three parts down and the question. Remember when you're writing the question down to highlight the keywords. Personally, what would I <clears throat> highlight out of that um, question? Um, use the character of the inspector, so the inspector, suggest ways society improved, personally. And then write down these three points that when you're writing your article, you can keep going back to those uh, three parts. Okay, so the, the, so the way you're going to structure it is going to be 45 minutes in total. So I wouldn't necessarily do it within, you know, say 50 minutes here and then 10 minutes Xbox and then 20 minutes there and 10 minutes bike ride, try to literally sit down and do it 45 minutes because the reason A is that your train of thought is going to be better and second it just gets you into that practice of sitting down because these are uh, very similar to questions you're actually going to have in the real exam in a couple of years time. So a plan a nuanced argument and three clear points. Include close analysis in every paragraph. Remember T14, I think you're probably sick to death of me saying T14, so we're going to zoom in, explode those quotes if you really need to. Remember that to occasionally relate to context, ideas, perspectives, so you could mention the NHS, you could mention the welfare state, you could mention uh, charity organisations, you could talk about religion, you could talk about the uh, Second World War. I wouldn't want to hear about all five of them, though. You need to make sure that you are talking um, you know, predominantly about um, you know, linking it to the audience and the choice of words and the techniques that he's used. Remember to discuss language, stage directions, other characters besides just the inspector and go back and use that chart, um, uh, essentially what you've just come across. So when you're three points you're going to make, maybe you want to talk about the language, maybe you want to talk about the sentence structure, maybe you want to talk about the final speech, maybe you want to talk about how Sheila has changed. Um, so the way that I would go about planning it, and I know that some of you really, really appreciate when I do this, so let's do this together. Let's change the camera over. Okay, so I, as you well know, I'm a huge fan of a mind map. So we do a mind map. Um, so I would perhaps try to just write down society and ideas. Perhaps we could talk about the NHS. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that it was 1945, and then we're going to talk about the idea of World War II. Uh, we could talk about the idea that they're um, unmarried mothers, perhaps. Um, what about the capitalist society? 
Um, on the top here, we also want to refer to um, Priestley himself. So let's talk about him. Now, do you remember we found out that he was um, very, very political, actually. Um, he obviously was um, you know, a, a massive socialist, and he believed that looking after uh, those that were less fortunate members of society, he believed passionately in social justice. So he, um, you could write uh, social justice. You can then write um, um, less fortunate. Do you remember that um, that key quote you um, of his when he was talking about the fact that he'd seen the mills firsthand and how he'd seen people um, coming out there and they'd been basically ruined and used by by society, which links in obviously the capitalist society to here. Okay, so with the NHS, perhaps I would or maybe take a different kind of pen or pencil. We could talk about um, Eva Smith. Um, pregnancy. Again, we can link that into unmarried mothers here. So maybe we want to put Eva Smith and the fact that um, she was obviously directly affected by Mrs. Burling. Um, what else we could say? Less fortunate capitalist society. Well, oh, that doesn't help. Pencil's just broken. Let's go back to using this card. Capitalist society, Mr. Burling. Um, paying wages. Remember, you get to do the work on the strikes. There was a reason I asked you to do that as well. Strikes. Okay, what else can we think about? World War Two. Well, that could obviously link in with unmarried mothers as well, because obviously there was that massive baby boom. There was also the idea of a united country, wasn't there, after the Second World War? Remember, with every single point, what you want to do is link it to to a character of how we, Priestley has used those characters as a vehicle to show what he was wanting to achieve with society. So perhaps we look at unmarried mothers for society. Well, that obviously clearly links in with um, Eric and the fact that he had got um, Eva Smith pregnant again. And used her for one thing. 1945. That again is linked a bit to Eric. The fact that um, you know there was a lot of premarital sex. Um, but we can also relate that to Gerald, can't we? Gerald. Um, as you can see, you can develop it. So then, like, once you've done this for about a good 10 minutes, I'll try and make it a bit bigger so you can see. Um, you can carry on doing this for a good 10 minutes and then if I were you I would go right well I am clearly going to talk about Mrs Burning I'm going to talk about the welfare state that should actually say welfare state up there as well um, state um, and then I'm going to also talk about um, oh, what would I choose? I like the idea of Mr. Burning. Obviously, you guys have done a lot of work on the strikes, um, but that also links in with the fact that she lost her job and the, and the welfare state. Now, in, in kind of contrast to those, I just make it so you can see, excuse my handwriting, my handwriting still hasn't approved after three months of being off. Um, what you can see is just change the camera. Okay. Um, what you, if you well, I don't know where I was going with that for a second. Um, yes, yeah, so you would have those two, the two, um, two characters. Now, because they are the two that remain pretty much static, they don't really change. The only change that we really see Mr. Burling have is where he acknowledges that he's potentially going to have a, a huge um, public scandal and he's trying to buy his way out of his responsibility. I might balance that with the idea that Sheila has changed, although she's been raised in this, in this way. She's been raised with the idea of this capitalist society where it's all about profit. She's also marrying into someone who believes uh, the same same um, ideas as her father, she makes the biggest change. So maybe I would balance those two points out uh, with Sheila. You don't have to do three characters as long as you do three points. 
always relate it to the end of the speech, if I were you, because that speech is vitally important. Remember, that's the final inspector's speech. He doesn't, he, after that, the moment he actually picks up his hat and off he goes, um, and he's left the audience of 1945, but also the room with the characters in, dumbfounded and thinking and, you know, inwardly kind of introspective of their, of their, of their part in the death of this young girl. So relate it back. I would suggest you just make messy notes just like that. Um, I find it fun, um, but it probably won't make, make, make much sense. Um, right, if you have any other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to email me or pop me a message on Teams. Um, I know some people have said that they've, um, they have uh, stopped the chat on the Teams and therefore some people are thinking that you can't message me. That's not necessarily true. There are ways, but obviously emails um, ping up onto my phone, onto my um, laptop. So email me and secondly, um, upload your answer to Teams by Sunday um, with cut-off date so that I can get your work marked and I can give you some, um, some targets to work on, help us feedback and then we can start on our new topic. Hopefully this lesson has been fine and you've understood it. Like I said, it's just so nice that everything's coming up to a point together um, and you hopefully, at the very least, you have a good, firm understanding of what the play is all about. Okay, have a lovely week and take care.